Hey everybody out there. My name is Dr. Frank Morgan. I've been a family doc now for uh, over 15 years. Uh, this year I did something remarkable. I quit my job. Yeah, I, uh, I got tired of trying to see about 10, uh, a person every 10 minutes and I realized I really couldn't do a very good job so I quit and I opened up a new style of practice. Uh, one of the main reasons I quit is, uh, is that I found that we could remarkably impact folks' life if we would just sit, sit down and spend the time with them. I'm going to sit down and spend the time with you today and talk about something that uh, was one of the key reasons that uh, I made the huge decision that I did. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a low carbohydrate diet and how it can affect you, your health, uh, your weight, and decrease your risk for the development of type 2 diabetes. In fact, if you've got type 2 diabetes and you're willing to work hard on your diet, you can actually fix this problem with diet alone. It's incredible. So um, over the years after medical school, um, I had heard a lot about things like the Atkins diet. I, I still remember when I was a young doctor back in the, uh, in the uh, late 90s. Um, I'd have people approach me and say, hey doc, can I do the Atkins diet? And you know, I really didn't know much about it at the time. You, you'd be surprised how little we learn in medical school about nutrition. Um, and I was always a little bit worried about that. I, I was worried about cholesterol. I'd say, yeah, it's all right, you know, but let's monitor your cholesterol, make sure that, uh, uh, that, we're, uh, that we don't have a cholesterol problem. But you know what ha kept happening time after time is people's cholesterol would get lower on their low carb diet and they would lose 40 to 50 pounds. And I was astounded by it. So began looking into it more and more and doing some of my own research. My brother got in, uh, interested in it. My little brother who's an engineer who works uh, up in, um, uh, in Washington. And he, uh, he, he would talk about it. And um, finally another uh, gentleman gave me a book about three years ago. The book is called The Art and Science of Low Carb Living, written by a couple of authors named uh, Volick and Finney. And they did a terrific job at really explaining uh, the physiology behind it. It was something I needed to be able to, uh, to get a, uh, an understanding on before I could really jump wholeheartedly on board. But once I read the book, I started trying this uh, approach on my type 2 diabetics. And I, I tell you what, we had, we had uh, patients who were deep into type 2 diabetes. They were overweight, and they would, they would come in, and they would just be disgusted, disgusted with themselves, disgusted with their weight. And they would say, Doc, tell me what to do. I'll do anything you want me to do. Tell me, I'll do anything. And so what, you know, what we'd do is I'd sit down, and you know, I'll tell you what, somebody comes in with a, 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 a statement like that, and I, you know, I've got to sort of hold the press. Here I am trying to stay on the hamster wheel and see a person every 10 minutes. But that would happen, I would sit down, and I'd go, OK, um, well, let me tell you what we need to do here. And after about 45 minutes, I could explain at least some of the details behind the low-carb diet. I think I didn't do a very good job at the time. Uh, nevertheless, when people would uh, follow through with these recommendations and put them in practice, what we were seeing is people's diabetes were going away. We have patients who had been on insulin who were, we were able to get completely off of their insulin for type 2 diabetes. Now, that didn't happen with 100% of our folks. Sometimes people will quit making enough insulin uh, in their pancreas, and I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit, but what, what, uh, what happened was remarkable. We began seeing people lose 40 to 50 pounds. We started affecting the change and really uh, getting people healthy rather than just writing them another medicine. So, uh, you know, that, the realization that we can do a better job with health care led me to do something really dramatic, and that was uh, this past year, I quit my job, opened up a different style of practice. So. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is something that I present to patients. Um, we do this about once a month on a low-carb seminar. And I had several patients say, hey, Doc, would you post this on YouTube? I'd really like to send this to my cousin and, and, and uh, wherever. And so, uh, so here we are. This is my first YouTube video. hope it goes well. So um, before we talk about carbs, I really need to uh, just kind of lay some foundational material and explain what is a carbohydrate anyway. So we're going to use this whiteboard. Uh, I'm going to draw, you know, I know there are probably some scientists out there that may laugh at this, but I, I, I just remember we're just trying to make this easily digestible for the average person out there. So um, what is a carbohydrate anyway? Uh, at its fundamental level, what a carbohydrate is, is uh, it's a, uh, a ringed molecule typically. It's got an oxygen at the top. It's connected to a couple of carbons like that, actually a ring of carbons. and. Uh, it looks like that. Now there's some other groups off of these carbons. We're not going to draw that right now. It's just confusing the picture. It doesn't even matter. This is just an abbreviation for the molecule glucose, which is the fundamental individual unit for a carbohydrate. 
So I'm going to abbreviate this even further, and I'm going to draw this. By the way, the way we utilize this for fuel is we can break some of the chemical bonds between the carbons. We do this, and so that releases energy. We've got uh, micro, uh, we got uh, uh, mechanisms within our cells and our mitochondria which can capture the energy, and uh, then we can turn around and use it for fuel. Uh, glucose is a terrific fuel for our body. It's as if we were made to consume glucose, and under normal circumstances, that's a terrific fuel for our bodies. The problem is we don't live like normal humans have been living for the past couple thousand years. So I'm going to erase this, and I'm just going to draw an abbreviated form of glucose. Here we go. I'm going to draw it like this. It turns out that if we have high concentrations of glucose, that that's really hard on living organisms. If you have high concentrations, so we're going to draw another thing. We're going to draw a flask here. Let's say we've got a flask. And inside that flask, we have some glucose. We're just going to depict it as these little dots here on the whiteboard. And let's say we have a really high concentration of glucose. It's hard for living organisms to live in a high concentration of glucose because what happens is it interrupts the fluid balances across cellular membranes through a process called osmosis. Uh, we have some, you probably have some pure straight up glucose in your kitchen. If you've got a bottle of light K-Rose syrup, that's pretty much pure glucose. If you could imagine this being light K-Rose syrup or maybe watered down light K-Rose syrup, that'd be, that'd be too strong for living tissue to be in and it, because it'd be harmful. For a diabetic um, who has high glucose levels, no, normal humans sort of run glucose between about, a, about 80 to 150 depending on when their last meal was. Um, Diabetics will run glucose up two, three, four hundred or more. Uh, when sugars run that high, it's hard on living tissues inside of our body, particularly the very smallest blood vessels that you have. It turns out that certain organs that we have are highly dependent upon these small blood vessels, things like your eyes and your kidneys and your uh, nerves and also your heart. And if you damage these small blood vessels, you can damage those organs. And that's why a type 1 diabetic or a type 2 diabetic, they end up having damage to those organs. All right. Uh, for, the other thing is, have you ever noticed that your light Cairo syrup never spoils? You can have it in the cabinet for years. You pull it out, it's exactly the same. It doesn't go bad. It doesn't go rancid. It doesn't mold. It's because nothing can live in there. It's too strong of a solution. Turns out that in plants, the same thing can happen. So when a plant gets ready to store up sugar for the plant's own energy, as in, for example, in a seed, um, it has to store it in such a way that it won't damage the plant tissue. So well, the way a plant gets by with this is it uh, attaches these glucose molecules together in long chains that are hooked together like this. Some, these go on for hundreds of units long. Sometimes they branch. That's not all that important to what I'm trying to demonstrate. And we have another name for that. Some people call that a complex carbohydrate, but it's more commonly just called starch. When we eat starch, what happens is that stuff is digested in our gut, and these chain links break, and this stuff turns into this stuff, just single molecules of glucose that we can absorb and use for fuel. So it turns out that starch includes things like potatoes and pasta and breads, stuff mainly from grains, also from taters. But uh, it turns out that uh, when you eat pasta, which is a complex carbohydrate, and you eat starch, you may as well be guzzling straight up k syrup because it turns into the exact same thing inside of your gut. Most folks don't realize that. Once it gets inside your, your gut and it's absorbed into your blood, and we'll just say for now, for the sake of this uh, conversation, that this now represents our blood, then it, if it gets in too high of a concentration, it's more than we can burn at one time. We've got to be able to deal with that. If we don't deal with it, it would damage our tissues. So we have an organ in our body. It lives right here in our abdomen behind our stomach, and it's called our pancreas. And inside the pancreas, the pancreas has a couple of functions. One is it, re it, it releases some digestive enzymes and digestive juices straight into the gut to help, help with digestion. But the other thing is there's little clusters of cells inside the, uh, the pancreas that are called beta cells. And they can release uh, insulin that goes into the blood, I guess, and it sends a signal. Insulin is a hormone. 
Uh, all hormones are chemical messengers. They, they give a message. The message that insulin sends is super important. So I'm going to say it a few times. And if you want to lose weight, you need to understand what the role of insulin is. Insulin is a signal that says this. Store the insulin. I mean the sugar. It says store the sugar. All right, so insulin says store. How do you think we store that sugar? If you guess fat, you're not alone. Most people think that uh, that's what I'm going to say, but it turns out we don't store sugar in the form of fat, at least initially and under normal circumstances. What happens is the insulin goes through our blood, and initially we will store that sugar in a form called glycogen. Just like plants store the starch in long chains to prevent an osmotic effect uh, generated by individual sugar molecules, we will store, we'll store the sugar uh, in clumps. I'm going to change colors here, like that. Now we don't store it in chains. These are, this is a clump, and uh, it's a big three-dimensional clump. There's rows going back towards the, the back, if you will. That makes sense. And uh, it's not stored as a dry powder. It's stored intermixed with water, and we store this stuff called glycogen. We put it in our liver and in our muscles, primarily. And that's pretty much it. At any given time, we can store about 1,500 calories worth of glycogen. And that's about it. Then our storages are full. Under normal circumstances, this is a terrific source of fuel for our bodies. If it's 11.30 in the morning and you've got to carry some boxes up and down stairs and you haven't had lunch yet and you're feeling kind of hungry, what you probably end up doing is you tap into your glycogen stores and then you have a little extra energy, you're able to complete the task. If you've ever been working out and you just all of a sudden hit a wall and you got this so-called so monkey on your back, there's a good chance that what's happened is you've run out of glycogen stores and you just can't go any farther because you're not very good at using any alternative fuel source. Well, we're going to get to why that's the case here in just a minute, but uh, I'm going to tell you a little story about uh, what, just to, under, just to explain what I mean by under normal circumstances and normal human activity. You see, we live in the, in, the, in the 21st century, and most of us are pretty sedentary. We don't have to work for our food. Uh, even farmers, they're driving a tractor or driving a pickup truck around. I grew up farming and ranching. It's kind of why I talk a little bit funny sometimes. I was down in southeastern New Mexico. But in any case, um, when I was a kid uh, working on the farm, I would have to do a lot of some, some sort of grunt work, hard labor. And uh, I want to tell you a little story uh, related to then and then later on in medical school as, and to how, as how it relates to uh, my own me metabolic uh, issues. So, uh, so here's a story. Uh, and this is, uh, this is typical of a lot of people, maybe a blue-collar guy who who ended up moving up in the business and later became the foreman. All right, I'm going to draw something here. This is depicting a fuel gauge. And uh, this, uh, this is the glycogen in the, fuel in the fuel gauge. So this is a fuel gauge. It's a glycogen fuel gauge. All right? And that represents being full. So here we go. Uh, first thing in the morning... My glycogen, you, anybody's glycogen stores is a little bit empty. Why? Well, you haven't had anything to eat all night. And you still have to breathe and your heart has to, has to beat and you still have some metabolic activity. So you wake up in the morning and typically this is why breakfast foods have a lot of carbohydrates. That's why you sort of feel like you need a bowl of cereal or some toast or maybe some muffins, bagels, donuts, hash browns. You know, a big country breakfast, maybe some pancakes. What we do when we do that is we fill up our glycogen store. So this is me about 25 years ago. This is how I ate for sure. I would, I would uh, get up in the morning. I was uh, still uh, in college, and I had a job in the summertime working as a farmhand. Um, I'd get up in the morning, have my country breakfast, fill up my glycogen stores, and off to work I'd go. I remember one day, uh, the, the guy I was working for, who's the cousin, I, he had me uh, shoveling out some feed out of some feed bins, and um, it was about 98 degrees, and I was shoveling it over into a truck because we were done with the feed bins, the cattle had been moved off. But uh, let me ask you a question. Do you think working like that in 98 degree weather, just shoveling big scoops of feed out of a feed bin that I could burn 
1,500 calories in a half a day? Oh, you bet I could. You bet you could do that. So by lunchtime, my glycogen fuel tanks would be running on empty. And that'd give me a feeling. What would that feeling be? I'd be hungry, super hungry. In fact, uh, that particular day, I remember, um, we went in and his wife was cooking up a big spaghetti dinner. And I remember I had two big heaping plates of spaghetti. When I say heaping, I mean, you couldn't put another noodle on it. I mean, another noodle would slide off the plate. So I had two big old plates of spaghetti and I ate those and had a, several glasses of iced tea and went out and uh, thought I was going to have to go do it again. Thankfully, I don't think he made me do that again. I think he felt sorry for I felt sorry for myself, but uh, filled up my glycogen storages again. Probably went and uh, did some other work, but it wasn't nearly as strenuous. By the end of the afternoon, close to supper time, burned those glycogen stores back down. And uh, go and have a big supper, lots of bread, definitely have some taters, fill those back up again, go back to bed, wake up in the morning, do it all over again. So what's wrong with that? The answer is nothing. This is how humans used to eat and live for hundreds of years. At least humans who uh, grew up in an agrarian society that had grains and, and taters and things like that available. Um, so, uh, so how do we eat now? Well, if we'll fast forward to my own life, about 10 years after that, I was in medical school. Um, I still would get up in the morning and have a big breakfast, uh, toast, uh, hash browns, breakfast burrito, what have you and to fill up my glycogen stores. Then I'd go on to class, and I'd sit there in class, sit on my rear end, and uh, probably expend some fuel. I mean, I was thinking pretty hard, but nothing like what I was doing when, we were, when I was a farmhand. And by lunchtime, it looked more, my glycogen fuel tank looked more like this. I really didn't have to eat. I still, eat, still had some energy, but we live in a culture where we eat three times a day. So I'd go eat and go over to McDonald's, uh, have a cheeseburger, or maybe go to the hospital, uh, um, the cafeteria and have a big big lunch eat whatever I wanted pizza what have you I'd fill that back up but after I've got it filled up I'd have some leftover food over here there's still too much sugar in my blood so remember our bodies can't tolerate that and insulin is sending a signal to store but we've stored enough already in our glycogen store so what do we do well we have an organ in our body it lives right here it's called our liver I'm going to draw a liver right here, and our liver is an amazing organ. It can do a lot of different things. We'll color that in a little bit. In the liver, under the effect of insulin, if our glycogen storage tanks are full, we'll begin to convert our glucose to another substance. Our liver can uh, turn uh, glucose to fat through a process called de novo fat synthesis. And that's just a fancy way of saying it's making fat from scratch. So here we go. In the liver, it turns that uh, sugar first into something called triglycerides. Triglycerides, uh, they don't uh, travel around in our blood, though, just by themselves. They have to be carried by something called a lipoprotein. Lipoproteins, after they become empty of their triglycerides, they turn out to become what we call low-density lipoproteins. And the more triglycerides you have, the more LDL you'll end up having to produce because you have to have something to carry all those triglycerides. LDL is a very well-known risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Listen, I spend most of my day trying to help people. To The reason I'm doing this is trying to keep them from having a heart attack. So we're treating their diabetes, their, uh, their high blood pressure, their high cholesterol, their elevated LDL, their metabolic syndrome, their big belly. We're doing all that not to make them look better, but so they don't have a heart attack. Uh, LDLs are, are carrying the fat somewhere, though. Where are they carrying it? You know, in our bodies, we can, we can store fat uh, in our subcutaneous tissues. We can store it around, but we can only store so much there. I mean, if you kind of think about it, your arms can get so fat, your legs can get so fat, your butt can only get so fat. But then what, there's a place on your body that just keeps on growing bigger and bigger, and it's your belly. And so under the influence of insulin, what we end up doing is we send our, our fat, our triglycerides, to our abdominal fat. All right, that's how we get to be, have a big belly. We used to call that a beer belly. There's a pretty good book written by a, a doc 
up in Chicago called Wheat Belly, and he makes the argument that it's all about wheat, and I think he's right. So this is, this is how it happens, that we end up turning our starch, whether it's something like a tater or something like bread, into fat, and we do it under the influence of insulin. But listen, one of the critical things is insulin is telling you to store. Listen, our body is smart. We don't take, we don't take our, our foodstuffs and store it and at the same time turn around and burn fat. You see, if your insulin levels are high, it's almost impossible to burn fat. Our bodies are smarter than that. We don't send uh, foodstuffs one way in the form of fat and at the same time turn around and burn fat at the same time. That wouldn't make any sense. So when we eat carbohydrates for breakfast, lunch, supper, and snack, like and that's typical in the American diet, we've got high insulin levels, and our hormones are fighting us and keeping us from being able to lose weight. So what would happen if we quit eating carbohydrates and quit eating starches with this diagram? Well, let me show you. It's pretty interesting. So what we're going to do is we're going to erase our, we're going to erase our starch up here. We're going to say we're going to quit eating it. So we don't have any starch, so we don't have any glucose. So the glucose level in our blood starts dropping. And then our body is going to need to turn this arrow around and use glycogen stores. And for about 24 hours, we'll be burning our glycogen stores. We'll, uh, we won't have high insulin levels. In about 24 hours, all of our glycogen is gone. We're using that for fuel and our glycogen fuel tank goes down to zero, or close to it, then what happens? Well, we need, to know, we need a source of fuel. We're still eating. The low-carb diet is not a starvation diet. So we're getting some uh, food in our diet, uh, mainly in two forms. We're going to get some dietary fat. We're going to get some protein. But we're not going to get glucose. It's gone. So um, it turns out that we can make some sugar out of our protein. This is a process that scientists refer to as gluconeogenesis, and we'll make a little bit of pro uh, glucose out of our protein. That sort of, that sort of holds a, a, a floor on our glucose level so that our sugar doesn't drop down to zero. We couldn't tolerate a sugar of, of zero. In fact, if it gets much below 40 or so, we're, we're going to start feeling really, really bad. If it gets below 20, you'll just flat turn off, you, and you're, you're, you, just, you just won't even be awake. So if our, uh, the, the protein can uh, convert in our liver uh, to, 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 some, to, to sugar, and uh, then we need to be able to have more fuel for our body. We don't want to be sacrificing our, our protein and our muscle and burning, uh, burning muscle. So what happens is our body begins to burn fat for fuel. And we start turning around these arrows. So fat goes in through this same pathway. These arrows get turned around like this. And we start using our liver as literally a triglyceride vacuum cleaner. It just sort of sucks up the triglycerides and uh, starts converting the triglycerides and the fat that we eat in our diet uh, to something called ketones. So I'm going to draw some ketones in here. Let's say the liver is kicking out ketones. We no longer have insulin levels. All right. We're going to just take our pancreas out of the picture for a moment. Now we've got some ketones in our blood. Our body can burn ketones very effectively uh, for fuel. In fact, there are whole cultures who for centuries, for millennia, for generations, have existed on low-carbohydrate diets with almost virtually no carbohydrates in some cases. They, the infants did it, the old folks did it, and uh, they made it just fine. In fact, they had a much lower chance of having heart disease, and they absolutely had much less obesity. Heart disease was non-existent in those cultures, actually. So, um, this is all pretty interesting. Um, one of the questions is, is how would this cause someone to lose weight? Well, there's a, there, that, if you're paying attention, you realize you're still eating proteins and fat, so you're still eating food. One of the questions is, is why would turning these arrows around cause somebody to lose weight? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is you get more, you get, 
you get, you get to be a bit more effective at burning fat for fuel in your liver. Our liver has to upgrade the metabolic machinery that we need to be able to effectively burn fat for fuel. We've got lots of fat on our body in, in terms of our, our, uh, our fuel. Remember how many, how many uh, calories I told you we store up in the form of glycogen? What I say is 1,500 approximately. Listen, I did the math the other day on my own body. I measured my body composition, and I was stunned to find out how many calories of fat I have on my body right now. And I'm not a fat guy. I have right now on my body 75,000 calories in the form of fat. Now this is how folks can live for days, sometimes weeks, without food if they get stranded at sea. As long as they have some water to drink, they'll be able to make it for weeks at a time because they can start burning their own fat for fuel. Alright, so if we, if we get better at burning fat for fuel in our liver, we're going to be more effective at burning our own fat. Um, there's another thing that happens though. When ketones build up in our blood, it's a little bit uh, satiating to us. It makes us not feel so hungry all the time. It's really kind of interesting when, when I first went on a low carbohydrate diet myself, some of the changes that I noticed. I, I, I used to have this uh, thing happen quite often, and if you're a guy, I, I think you'll probably relate to it. I'd go through the drive through at uh, a Sonic or a Wendy's or something like that, and uh, I'd have a double cheeseburger, fries, and a pop. And uh, after I got finished, I'd have a thought. Uh, I'd think, man, I sure would like another hamburger. Sometimes I'd go back through that drive through and eat another one, just being honest. Uh, that's not a good idea. I don't recommend it. But uh, nowadays when I have that cheeseburger, uh, double meat, double cheese cheeseburger, no bun, no fries, no pop, maybe some water or, or unsweetened tea, I can hardly get through that cheeseburger. And I, and I have thought, it's man, I, I can't have another bite. I can almost eat it all, but I just can't quite finish it. So uh, having ketones in our blood is a little bit satiated. It kind of reminds me of something. Have you ever seen in the wild a fat deer? No. They all look the same. Every deer is perfect. I mean, they're, they're slim and trim. And you know what? There's something else you'll never see, is a deer purposefully exercising. I mean, that's ridiculous. What would it be doing? Bounding across the fence back and forth? So uh, it turns out we have signals in our body that we ought to listen to that, uh, that tell us when we've had enough to eat and, and, when, and when we need something to eat. We're supposed to have these. You know, our body doesn't want us to be fat. No more than our body wants us to be skinny. We foul up these signals with the things that we eat. And I think having high insulin levels also fouls up that signal. I think there's a reason why that happens just from, you know, if you kind of think about, uh, about, uh, about mankind and, and, the, and the different cultures that we live in. And I'll, I'll get to that in just a little bit. But if we just could listen to our signals and quit fouling them up with the stuff that we eat, I think uh, we'd have a lot less trouble. Now, I love my low-carb diet. It's one of the things that, uh, that I'll, I'll get to. Uh, it's just so exciting to be able to promote a diet or a lifestyle that is just so satisfying. Um, so I really don't feel hungry. It's kind of nice. I, I love the food. I don't feel hungry. I mean, that's the way to go. If you're on some diet where you're walking around and you feel sluggish and you're tired and you're just suffering, you need to find a new program. You shouldn't feel bad when you're trying to get healthy. So uh, that's, that's uh, probably the main reason. I'll tell you, there's one other reason, though, and it has to do with sugar. Now, I give a whole different talk on sugar, and you may want to look for that also if you find this interesting. Uh, sugar also interrupts our ability to feel full, even more so than carbohydrates. It turns out that uh, sugar consumption has increased dramatically in the past 30 years, and that may be the big reason for the obesity epidemic. Well, I'm not talking about trying to keep from getting fat. I'm, I'm trying to help you to, to lose that weight. And in order to do that, I think the low-carb diet is really a really good approach. So this is, uh, this is how, uh, how to do it and what happens. And now I'm going to get into some more details in part two uh, about exactly what the ins and outs and the pitfalls of the low-carb diet are. But basically what you want to do is you want to turn these zeros around so that you can effectively burn fat for fuel in your liver turn them into ketones so that it'll suppress your appetite and you can begin to have appropriate signals and that weight will start coming off. And that's pretty much it.